going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And thanks for all the work that you do putting this together. And it's so amazing. I hope you feel very validated by the fact that you're attracting people from outside of our community. People are coming from all these distant places to listen to these. So this is great. Yep. It's a really Thank good you. resource. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to start by saying that I appreciate everyone being here. And I usually take at least two or three hours to share some of this information since we only have a lunch time to do this. Um, I've tried to put things in writing so you're going to be able to look at the PowerPoint and review some of this information in more detail if you want to. And um, I, I want to start off by saying that uh, what, what really I'm teaching is a kind of a neurologically informed CBT. That is, CBT is the approach we're using, but it's trying to not just use CBT as ev a good evidence-based approach to anxiety, but to also realize what we're doing in the brain when we um, ask people to engage in different kinds of interventions and when we carry out in interventions in our in our sessions. What I'm really trying to do is to help us recognize what changes we're making in the brain and what we're trying to do in the brain because it really helps inform your therapy and helps you understand what you're doing. And I tried to put this into some writing in that Rewire Your Anxious Brain book of mine. Um, and that is intended for the average person, not for therapists. Uh, so don't feel if, if um, you don't have the background in neurology, that you won't understand. Uh, in fact, the two, there's really two major parts of the brain we're gonna be talking about that help you understand the underpinnings of anxiety in the brain. And those are the cortex, that's the, the part most people think of when we talk about the brain, the gray matter, the largest part of our brain where our thinking and reasoning comes from. It also processes our sensory information, helps us see and hear things, um, touch things. It's the part that initiates movement. It's basically, the biggest part of our brain and what we humans are often very um, proud of. Now, on the other hand, there's another part that not everyone knows about, but we're, get, we're getting there. We're getting people to understand the amygdala. I was referring to this um, with Lisa earlier when I said, uh, I think we activated your amygdala, Lisa. And this is the part of our brain that produces fear and anxiety and dread. And um, it produces the fight or flight response, which are all part of this um, defensive protective system that we have built into us that we don't have a lot of control over. It occurs on, a, it really occurs on a, um, a, from a level of our brain we're not very conscious of, you know, parts of our brain that, that um, control our breathing and control our digestion and all kinds of things like that. We don't wanna be aware of that. Well, the amygdala is kind of part of that process of, those processes that you're not necessarily aware of, but it definitely has a strong impact on our um, bodily reactions, on our emotional reactions, and it does more than anxiety. But I only have an hour here. I'm, I'm focusing on just anxiety and the amygdala. So knowing that this is related to the fight or flight response, knowing that this is related to, um, uh, it's not a logical, knowing it's not a logical process of our brain, um, and it learns in a completely different way than the cortex. Those two parts of the brain are what we're going to want to talk about today and how they are part of our treatment process. And what those are the parts of the brain we're often trying to change when we're treating anxiety. So what I wanted to do is to, um, let me see, uh, share my screen here and to this one. So we'll see. And there we go. Um, start this slideshow to get the show on the road. So um, I've already talked a little bit about the cortex and the amygdala, but I put this in writing for you so that you would be able to um, review the information. I have to necessarily take a lot of notes and look over this in your own time. A uh, couple things to know about the structure of the brain. The cortex has very few connections to the amygdala, which means that since the cortex is the part of the brain that we have some influence over and that gives us information, this means that the parts of the brain where we impact and can control and the parts that we're aware of don't have much ways of controlling the 
amygdala. And the amygdala, on the other hand, has a lot of connections into the cortex, so your amygdala can impact the cortex. And this is important to recognize because it lets us know that the amygdala has the ability to monitor what we're thinking about in our cortex, what we're, we're sensing, hearing, seeing, and also it has the opportunity also to influence what goes on in the cortex, to influence what we think about, what we look at, what our attention is drawn to, whether it's hearing or whatever. And so um, when you try to explain these two parts of the brain and how they both operate with some of our clients, you might want to use the example of driving down the road and how your cortex is pretty much in control. It is seeing what is on the road. It is hearing the blaring of horns or screeching of brakes or whatever's happening on the road. But at any moment, the amygdala is also processing that information. And that amygdala also has the ability to react and to take, actually to take control of the cortex. So then instead of relying on your thinking processes, your, your amygdala can cause you, if let's say your amygdala detects something coming into the lane uh, in front of you, the amygdala has, the way, has a way of taking charge of you and having you grasp the wheel and turn that wheel quickly before you can even think of what to do. And so in that way, sometimes the amygdala can basically hijack your cortex and take charge of you so that you may veer out of the lane when something comes in front of you. And you kind of have to think, what did I just do? What just happened? And it actually, the amygdala can work more quickly than the cortex can. And it's probably saved your life several times where it has caused you to do something. Now, this is not reflexes. Reflexes come from your, your spinal cord. And that's if you took something hot and you pull back. This is a part of your brain that sees and hears things and can allow you to react to them faster than the cortex can react. So we need to kind of understand how it is that, that happens and, and explain it to our clients because it can help us to treat them. So what I'm gonna do is give you kind of an illustration here of how I simplify this to show it to clients. Now I'll show clients an image of the brain and I will review with them what the brain looks like. But I also want to show them this simplified image where I say there's three things that I'm going to kind of explain to you. And the first thing is that all the information that comes into the brain, all, whether it's what you're seeing, what you're hearing, whatever, what's happening is that part of your brain, um, it receives the information first and it sends it to places where it needs to go in the brain to be processed because what you see gets processed in the back of your head and what you hear gets processed on the sides of your head. Now that part of the brain that I'm talking about that gets that sensory information first, it's called the thalamus. It's right in the center of the brain, kind of shaped like a walnut. The reason that's important is because it's gonna show you there are actually two pathways to anxiety we need to be aware of. One pathway to anxiety involves the cortex and one pathway to anxiety does not involve the cortex, but both pathways to anxiety involve the amygdala. So let's look at this illustration here and see if you can identify those two pathways. Here's what we're talking about. When you have information coming in from what you're seeing as you drive down the road, that information comes in and goes to your thalamus. Your thalamus says, I'm gonna send this information to the cortex so that it can be processed, gets sent back to the back part of your brain so that you can see it. And when it's processed back here in the back part of your brain, that's when the visual information that you're getting is something you see. You can't see it until your cortex processes it. All right. So then if the cortex sees something that is anxiety provoking, that information is actually also available to the amygdala. The amygdala, even though the arrow here kind of goes from the cortex to the amygdala, to be more accurate, it's more like that the amygdala is watching what goes on in your cortex. It's monitoring it. So when the amygdala sees something in your cortex, something or hears something from your cortex, where it gets information from the cortex somehow, the amygdala has the potential to identify that as dangerous and to initiate the anxiety response. Notice that the cortex cannot, Catherine, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you for one second? Your, um, your slideshow has not progressed, so we're all just seeing your title slide. So are oh. you referencing a slide? 
Okay, stop share. I'm seeing I'm seeing another shot a slide, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I want I really want this on the screen. So let's make sure we can get it on the screen. Yeah. Somewhere. We'll stop so, everything and I'll make sure. Now it doesn't look like the slideshow actually started. Um, so I want to say, okay, slideshow from beginning. Okay, have that. Let me go to the next slide. Did it advance? It's now at the picture of the brain, the one that you were trying to talk about. And just so you know, on the left- This one here? This one here? Yeah. Uh, That's wait. the one that you want to talk about. Uh, let's see, somebody is saying, don't put your PowerPoint into full screen mode. Okay. Don't put your PowerPoint into full screen mode? That's what somebody is suggesting. Okay, okay. So let me try that. Right, you have what you need right now though, correct? Yeah, so you 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 are progressing through by pressing on those. I wanna say slide two. I want to say from beginning, I want, and right now it just turns it into, it turns it naturally, as soon as I make it a presentation, it becomes full screen mode. Okay. I don't know how to make it not full screen. Well, what slide are we on now is the question. You're on the one with the picture that you were just referencing. Okay, so well, while I'm talking about this, maybe you can try to pull it up and see what you can do. And I'll try, because I'm not sure I can advance. I don't know how I got here because I thought I was here. But let me continue the explanation. Okay. And you see if you can pull up the show and if you can take it over, that could be good. I, uh, so I don't believe that I can pull Okay, okay. So let me just computer. finish the explanation, and every time I'll check to make sure if you have the slides you need. Okay, right. I think as long as you, um, with the red box, you're seeing a red box, as long as you are clicking on that slide, that's what should be coming up. I don't have a red box. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, let me just say, okay, so we have the explanation of the cortex, right? So um, let's say, though, also what we said is when you are watching the, the traffic around you on the highway. The thalamus is also receiving that information and sending it directly to the amygdala. And it gets to the amygdala faster than it gets to the part of your cortex that needs to process it. So basically I want to say that the amygdala sees things before you see them, meaning it can also react to things before you see or hear them or react to them. So when we talk about this thalamus to the amygdala pathway, this, this amygdala pathway, it's a quicker pathway and it also results in quicker responses, both physical responses, emotional responses, and physical responses can happen before your cortex is done processing the information. So we have two pathways that can create the anxiety response, one directly from the thalamus to the amygdala where it reacts to sensory information directly. But I want to point out, it's not the same sensory information you get from your cortex. That's the detailed sensory information. The amygdala processes, gets unprocessed information. So sometimes its information is incorrect. So it may see something that looks like a snake, but it's actually a stick. And it might react to that stick as if it were a snake because it doesn't get the detailed processing information. But in a second, when that cortex finishes processing it, and the amygdala can see the cortex identifies that as a stick, not a snake, then the amygdala kind of will stand down some of the emotional reaction it created, but it can't turn it off immediately. So now here's the moment to try to go on to the next slide. So let me see what happens, and Lisa, if you can tell me, um, I'm going to talk about this slide. Now, and which slide am I on? You're still on four, so if you can scroll down uh, to number five. And I, I did, but okay, so okay, now so what I'm going to do. So now now we have that. Mm -hmm. Can you see another slide now? What do you see now? Uh, the suit jacket. Yes, that's what we want. Okay. So looking at this particular slide, I'm going to give you an example of how this works in real life. And here we have a little girl. She's going into the basement of her house to get a tennis ball, tennis racket, and she's kind of nervous about the basement in general. And when she gets down in the basement, it's a little dark in the corners and there's an image that she sees in the corner. And which part of her brain is gonna receive that visual information first? 
it is going to be obviously the thalamus. The thalamus is going to send it to two different parts of your brain, to the cortex and to the amygdala. But which part gets it first and processes it first? The amygdala. And the amygdala gets the rough image of it. So, so the image that you see on the left part of your screen there, that image is what her amygdala is processing. It's kind of a dark shadowy image that maybe could be threatening. So the amygdala is likely to react to that image in a way that produces fear, anxiety. And not just that, but also the physical reactions of the fight or flight response. Like she may jump back, she, her heart rate may increase, right? So as that happens, what happens with this little girl is she becomes, um, her heart pounds, she jumps back, she has a rush of adrenaline in her body, but at the same time that's going on, her cortex is processing the information. It takes it longer to get processed, but within a fraction of a second, she sees what the object actually is when the cortex processes it in detail. And here's what it is. It's a suit coat hanging down there in the basement. That's what I put down there for storage, whatever. And once she sees that and her amygdala processes what's going on in the cortex, then her amygdala starts to react differently. It stops producing all of the response that we saw, the fight or flight response, the anxiety, the fear, all that. But what's happened is adrenaline has been released and we can't really put that adrenaline back, right? Her muscles have tensed up and her heart rate has started. It's gonna take a little while for all that to go down but the truth is it will go down. And the reason it doesn't go down is because of the setup in the brain here that the amygdala is allowed to override and to act before the cortex. So if you understand this setup in the brain, then you can understand anxiety a little better. All right, so, and I definitely, you know, I'm trying to go quickly so that we can have questions at the end. So what you need to see here is that there are two pathways that can create anxiety. One relies on the amygdala directly. So this is um, when we react to something and we often don't understand this reaction. The amygdala is producing a stress response and in your thinking processes, you may think it's illogical. You may even realize, say, I don't know why I'm reacting this way. But sometimes it seems logical to you that you should react. It's just that the amygdala is not reacting on the basis of logic. So one of the things I should point out, and this is going on to another slide here, in my explanations, you know, you can, you can look at more of what I typed out so that you didn't have to take notes. But here I want you to know that one thing that that amygdala is doing is it's activating the sympathetic nervous system. So we're gonna see things like the pupils dilating and it's going to, um, actually inhibit salivation, dry out your mouth, your bronchi are going to dilate. So if you do a lot of breathing, you know, if you, you're going to get hyperventilated easily. Also, we're going to see that it inhibits your digestion. So your stomach sometimes feels kind of nauseous. You also um, have an increased stronger heart rate that is happening. Your heart pumps not only stronger, but it also pumps quicker. And it's not the quick that you feel so much as the stronger. And it feels different than your typical heart beating because it's a stronger. Um, the reason it's doing that is because it's trying to push the blood harder to get it into your extremities because getting you ready to fight or to run. And, and that's the purpose of this. It also um, tends to do other things. Let me think like it, in, it increases the likelihood you might feel like you have to urinate. All of these are part of that amygdala creating the fight or flight response. And they all seem to make sense if your goal is to run or to fight right now. But that's not usually what we need in our current world to help us with the things that we're anxious about, whether it's you know the coronavirus or paying the mortgage or, or if it's we're worried about our mother um, or whatever we happen to be worried about, usually running and fighting aren't the kind of appropriate responses that work now, but that's still built into us and still what we're experiencing. Now, this is such a helpful slide that I gave you. It's, and it's also a free slide because it's produced by the federal government and we pay for it with our tax dollars. So I gave you the uh, source that you can go get this yourself to show it to clients if you want. 
Now, knowing about the amygdala, knowing that it produces all of these kinds of responses, helps us explain to our clients what anxiety really is. Anxiety is the emotional feeling that we have when we're going through the fight or flight response or a portion of it, a little bit has been activated, or maybe it's a full blown fight or flight response, in which case you're having a panic attack. So all of these things are ways in which we can try to explain that anxiety feels terrible, but what it really is, is nothing dangerous, although we feel in danger. Sometimes the amygdala is right, like when a car is coming across a lane at you, and sometimes the amygdala is wrong, like when it sees a stick in the woods that it reacts to as if it's a snake. And we need to understand these processes if we want to be effective therapists for people and explain to it why it is that certain things happen with anxiety. Like, why do I know in one part of my brain that it doesn't make sense and I'm afraid of getting into the passenger seat of a car with my best friend? Whereas there's another part of my brain that is panicking when I try to get into the front seat of the car next to my friend. And this might have to do with the amygdala. The amygdala might have learned from you being in an accident that sitting in a passenger seat is not safe. And so it's reacting to a situation, but your cortex is saying this doesn't make sense. I realize I'm perfectly safe, but my body is telling me I'm not safe. Part of my brain is telling me I'm not safe. So helping understand that there's two parts of your brain that contribute to anxiety. How does the amygdala react to anxiety? Well, um, it doesn't learn through what you tell it or through logic. It really learns only through experience. So if you've been in a car accident or you have, say, a woman has been sexually assaulted, the situation that that person is in is tagged by the amygdala as dangerous. So if the person was sexually assaulted while a Beatles song is playing, when she hears that Beatles song, the amygdala is going to react to that song as if it's a sign of danger. Or if you try to get into the passenger seat of a car after you've been in an accident in that seat, the amygdala is going to react as if it's in danger. That's not a logical thing. It's learned according to pairings. It's learned according to association, which is the language of the amygdala. So this is why I try to teach my clients that they really need to learn the language of the amygdala so that they can communicate with the amygdala and teach it new things. And in particular, I say, when I'm doing therapy, I'm a lot of the time I'm trying to teach your amygdala new information. But the trouble is everything I say to you in the session is not doing anything for your amygdala because it doesn't learn from my lectures that I'm giving. It only learns from experience. So if I want your amygdala to know that that passenger seat isn't dangerous, that you can listen to that song without being in danger, it has to experience that song. It has to experience that passenger seat for it to learn. And so I try to say those things have become triggers for fear. And I try to explain to them what you probably know about as being identified as classical conditioning. But I don't talk to my clients about classical conditioning. I talk to my clients about how triggers are learned by the amygdala, how the amygdala is the part of our brain that can learn what is a dangerous situation. And this is not just in the human brain, this is in dogs' brains, cats' brains, horses' brains. If something negative happens in a certain situation or associated with a certain sound or even a certain person, a bad thing occurs, the amygdala can turn that, uh, that memory of that person, situation, sound into a trigger. So once a trigger has been paired with a negative event, and you may know this is a CS and a UCS, but there's no reason to explain that to your clients, use terms like trigger and negative event. Once there's been a pairing that occurs, it could be with a silly thing like a little boy who's being visited by his grandmother and she comes toward him bringing him a teddy bear and he comes running toward his grandmother and falls on the sidewalk and splits his lip open. The last thing he saw before he hurt his lip was that teddy bear. He may now be terrified of teddy bears, right? It's not a logical thing. It's completely about something being paired with a negative event. And that negative event, because of that pairing, has given the amygdala this information that this trigger signals danger. And the amygdala is trying to protect us. But sometimes the amygdala is wrong. That teddy bear is perfectly safe, you know? Or the passenger seat is perfectly safe, depending on who you're driving, riding with. It could be perfectly safe. But the amygdala won't listen to that kind of logical information. 
So what happens with that trigger, what happens with that trigger is there's been a learning process in the amygdala and we can teach the amygdala how to change and how to learn new information in that situation. So I gave you some slides that you can, can use with your clients in order to, to um, explain this process to them and just kind of go through it for yourself. So those are in there for you. But I also wanna have you now teach your clients how exposure is the best way to teach the amygdala about triggers and how to change the, the memories related to those triggers. So let's look at that kind of a slide here, pulling this up. And remember, all of this is gonna be available to you. You're gonna be able to see this, but that one, that one, I'm gonna do this one. All right, so let's say the amygdala learns through experience. And in this case, we're talking about a young child who first time he goes to visit grandma and her kitty, the kitty, uh, he wants to hug the kitty and the kitty doesn't like that. So the kitty scratches him. And so he's hurt, right? So the cat has been paired with this negative experience of a scratch. So now the amygdala is going to react to the cat as though the cat is dangerous. Or another way to say that is the amygdala is going to produce the fight or flight response in response to cats, right? Now that means when the child sees a cat, the child will experience anxiety, his heart rate's gonna go up, he's gonna probably feel nauseous in his stomach, he's gonna feel like running away. It's the fight or flight response. How do we change that? Well, the amygdala has to learn through experience. So the amygdala needs to be exposed to that trigger. So you put the child in the presence of a cat. This can be a gradual process. You might even start with pictures of cats or talking about cats to make it a gradual process. But what we wanna make sure is that there's no negative events paired with that cat. We wanna make sure that this experience is a positive or neutral one. So the child does not have another pairing which just strengthens that learning in the amygdala. We're trying to teach the amygdala something new. So when we do exposure, exposure is teaching the amygdala. And what I find is if you add in this information about the amygdala, you might say, why can't I just do exposure? Why don't I just do it without mentioning the amygdala? I found it's very useful to talk to clients about their amygdala to help them kind of sort out their experience that comes from the amygdala and that comes from their cortex because they seem more willing to talk about teaching their amygdala when they know there's something there they're teaching when it isn't just about, I want you to get over your fear of this cat, I'm gonna put you around a cat. If we say, you know why you're having this reaction to the cat? If, do you know how to change this? And you know what? Talking about the amygdala as a part of themselves help them, helps them have some distance from their fears, helps them to be more mindful about them, helps them to take a different approach to their fears. And so it's useful to introduce this concept of the amygdala. But the amygdala, of course, need some explanation. And I never explain it in one session. It, this is always something we do slowly, relating it to the client's experience. I don't talk about cats with all of my clients. Sometimes I talk about enclosed spaces. Sometimes I'm talking about talking in front of people is what they react to as their trigger. But I really say the trigger and your reaction to the trigger comes from the amygdala. And we need to speak the language of the amygdala to get this to change. And so when I wrote rewiring your anxious brain, you know, and I was working with Lisa Carl as an author. Um, she also was very helpful because she was dealing with a lot of different anxiety issues. She was telling me, this is stuff I find helpful. It helps me understand my anxiety. But I, I would sometimes want to explain more. She would say, I don't need to know all those details. It's really basically the amygdala and the cortex. We don't need to go down into any more details about the brain than that to help our clients get this understanding of what the amygdala um, is all about and how to help them to understand what they can do to educate their amygdala differently, how it is that they can change their amygdala, rewire their brain, and teach the amygdala to, re to uh, respond in a new way. Now, we don't have to get clients over all of their fears. It's important to focus on the ones that are impairing their ability to live their life. So sometimes people say, I'm afraid of riding on a train. And I say, okay. They say, should I try to get over that? I said, do you need to ride on a train? Not really, you know. Well, then I said, let's not worry about that. But, you know, 
you do need to be able to visit your grandchildren and they have that dog. And you say that your fear of that dog is keeping you from visiting your grandchildren. So let's focus on that fear. It makes a difference in your life. And leave, I don't care, fear of spiders, you could keep that unless maybe you're a plumber, you need to get over your fear of spiders. So what we're gonna do is not easy to teach the amygdala, it requires you to be exposed to things that create a negative reaction in your body. It's not dangerous, but it's very unpleasant. And I don't want to do it for everything. I want to do it for things that if you change your emotional reaction to them, you will actually be able to have a better life and reach the goals in your life that you want to reach. Okay, so um, this whole process of trying to understand how the amygdala contributes is probably the most important part that I'm adding into what therapists don't use. We don't usually talk about the amygdala. So I say, some people call me the amygdala whisperer, you know, because I'm trying to communicate with the amygdala. I say, I want to turn you all into amygdala whisperers. I want you to all be able to communicate with the amygdala. There's a couple things we do that I should, before I leave talking about the amygdala, the amygdala is very sensitive to low levels of sleep and it is more reactive when you don't get good sleep. So I really work with my clients on improving their sleep and show them how that relates to calming down their amygdala. People often won't improve their sleep unless they really feel it has a purpose. The American culture is not very, not very open to being dedicated to the kind of sleep the amygdala needs, which is extended sleep like eight hours where you get plenty of REM sleep. Um, so when you say the amygdala, you may not feel you need more sleep, but the amygdala does. Sometimes that motivates people. And once they see that getting better sleep, getting eight hours of sleep calms their amygdala down, um, and people usually recognize this right away, they, they are more, more invested in that. Another thing is exercise really helps the amygdala. So I would want to tell my clients um, to increase their exercise because that tends to calm the amygdala down. In fact, it can calm the amygdala down in a, in a matter of 10, 15 minutes. If you're very anxious and you go for a run, strange thing is even though that run has not changed anything you're anxious about, say it's you're paying your mortgage, you just feel better. It calms the amygdala down. Why? Because the amygdala thinks you should engage in the fight or flight response. When you run, it's kind of like a feedback mechanism you got away. You didn't get away from the mortgage, but your amygdala doesn't know that. It's not logical. It's not a logical process. So understanding the amygdala is so important for all of us therapists. Now, if I say though, what about the cortex? There's a whole process here, <coughs> excuse me, when the cortex is what is starting the anxiety. This is more common with generalized anxiety disorders, with OCD, those types of things. So um, the cortex, it can't create anxiety without the amygdala. Only the amygdala can create fear, anxiety, the fight or flight response. Um, so the way that the cortex creates anxiety or fear or the fight or flight response is by activating the amygdala by the thoughts that it is producing. So if you produce thoughts that the amygdala, which is kind of watching the cortex, the amygdala sees um, something in the cortex, uh, something we thought about in the cortex or something seen in the cortex that the amygdala didn't recognize when it was processing the information, then the amygdala will react to that. So that's when the cortex ignites the information. I'm sorry, that's when the cortex ignites the amygdala. And here's a, kind of an illustration of this. That's when something comes in through the thalamus and it didn't necessarily, wouldn't be activating the amygdala. We're talking about the other pathway here where the cortex interprets it and the amygdala reacts to the cortex's interpretation. Let me give you a quick example of this. Let's say there's a, a woman who's um, staying, actually she's, she's married, but her husband, he loves to go fishing every summer. And so he leaves for two weeks, goes up into Canada for a fishing trip. She doesn't really appreciate this so much, but he loves him, he loves fishing, so she, she's happy to have him do that. But when she's alone in her house, she sometimes um, has some anxiety. So let's talk about a, kind, a time when the anxiety came from the cortex pathway. And I'm gonna ask you if you think it's good or bad that it came from the cortex pathway. So this anxiety occurs when she's in her house by herself and she hears a sound that she hears 
very frequently to inner typical life. And that is the sound of the door from the garage into the kitchen being opened and closed. She hears this a lot. It means someone's coming from the garage into the kitchen and that door is identifiable. Now, when the amygdala processes that information, when the amygdala processes it, the amygdala doesn't identify that as a dangerous sound in any way. It's a familiar sound. The amygdala doesn't react to it. But when that's processed in the cortex, the cortex processes it and identifies it because the cortex processes things in detail. So it actually hears the sound, allows her to hear the sound and interprets the meaning of it and says, that's someone coming in through the garage door into the kitchen and the door is closing. But who could that be? Because Frank is in Canada and there shouldn't be anyone coming in my garage door right now. Now, once she has that thought, the cortex creates an image, not just the thought, but also an image of someone breaking into her house or coming in to harm her. And as she has that image in her cortex, the amygdala reacts to the image in her cortex. Now, the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing for this woman that her amygdala reacts to just a thought she has in her cortex? This is nothing she's seen. It's just a thought that she's having. But in this case, I think you'll agree that it's good that the amygdala relies on the cortex at times to tell it when there's a danger. Because sometimes the cortex sees, understands things, interprets things in a way that the, the amygdala can't. So that would be an example of when the cortex pathway creates anxiety. It creates anxiety through the way it interprets what it's being seen or heard. It creates anxiety by creating images that activate the amygdala or thoughts that activate the amygdala. So another example might be useful to look at here. I gave you a little more information that you can use. Let's say there's someone who's applied to college and is going out, a high school student here, and this high school student is getting a letter out of the mailbox watching vigilantly for that reaction from the college. And as the student gets this, gets into the mailbox and sees this envelope, the amygdala doesn't react to the envelope as if it's dangerous. The amygdala doesn't really read things. It, it more reacts to general information about what it is. Is it a four-legged thing? You know, is it a box? Is it big? Is it moving? Is it, you know, it doesn't react to it in the way that the cortex can. So an envelope is not going to cause the amygdala to have a reaction. But when this person looks at the envelope, they see the college, the name of the college that she wants to go to is written on this envelope, but this envelope is very thin. And she thinks to herself, this envelope looks like a rejection letter. So her interpretation of that envelope is that it's a rejection letter. What she thinks about the envelope is this is a rejection from my very favorite college. Once she sees that, the amygdala is going to react to what the cortex is thinking and seeing, right? So then the amygdala might react to what is going on in the cortex, not to the envelope itself, but to the cortex's interpretation. So what we need to help our clients realize is we can help them calm their amygdalas down. We can do it by working on relaxation breathing, which calms the amygdala down. We can help them by exercising, which calms the amygdala down in a matter of minutes, actually. We can help them, oh, by the way, that relaxation breathing actually calms your amygdala down. If we watch it with an fMRI, actually calms your amygdala down faster than Xanax, which takes about 30 minutes. Relaxation breathing, you can do it in less than 10 minutes. We can see a change in the amygdala in terms of its calming down, not being as activated. So we can use relaxation breathing. We can use getting good sleep. We can use exercise. These things all affect the amygdala. And we should be looking at them as potential help for the person reducing their overall anxiety or their overall activation in the amygdala. Then we should also be doing exposure, right? Presenting things that they have a bad reaction to, riding in a car, giving speeches in front of people, having a conflict with a person and standing up with, for themselves. We want them to be exposed to those things so their amygdala can get over the emotional reaction that it has to them. But we also have to remember that the amygdala can be very calm, minding its own business, seeing no danger, and the cortex can come up with an idea that could activate the amygdala, even though there may not be a danger. Like let's say this person opens up the envelope reads the envelope and the envelope not only says she was accepted, but it says she gets a scholarship. So it's a great envelope, but the amygdala is reacting to it as if it was a danger because the cortex was interpreting it as if it were a danger. 
So these are the kinds of examples I talk about with my clients. You can put in their own life experiences. You know, you could say, yes, it's good that that woman uh, reacted to the sound of the garage door, you know, into her kitchen. But what about when she's in bed at night and she hears something scratching against her window and she thinks someone's got an exacto knife slicing the window and they're going to climb in and assault her. It's probably a branch scratching the window, you know. So sometimes the cortex is right about its interpretations and sometimes it's wrong about its interpretations. And I have a little bit of information I skipped over but gave you anyway about how we can't trust the cortex because sometimes the cortex sees things that aren't there. I'll show you this slide very quickly if you can look about. Like you might want to read this here. Um, and you might read that that says once upon a time there was a wizard, but that's absolutely not what it says. It says once upon a, a time. The cortex takes out that extra A. Sometimes the cortex misses important information, and sometimes the cortex puts in information that isn't even there. Like many of you might say, I see a white triangle there, but there's not a white triangle there. Your cortex is actually creating lines that don't exist because it's used to filling in information that we can't see when something's in front of something in our visual field. So our cortex is not always right. And we have warriors and people with OCD who come up with thoughts that are grounded in reality, but that scare the amygdala. And this really helps me sometimes because I get tired of arguing about the logic of a certain thought. But if I can say, you are activating your amygdala with this thought. I would really like you to stop activating this thought. I would like you to stop that. And let me explain to you how you can do things in the cortex. You know, the cortex has a completely different way we have to work with the cortex. We have to remember that the way that we interpret things is going to influence how our amygdala reacts. So if I'm walking my dog down the street and I see a fire truck with its sirens, um, blaring and the lights flashing and it's flying up the street back toward my house. And I think to myself, when I see that fire truck, my house is on fire. That is going to activate the amygdala. I'm going to start having thoughts and images in my, in my cortex that are going to activate the amygdala. So this idea that it's the interpretations in our cortex that lead to anxiety. It isn't the fire truck itself that caused anxiety. I can see a fire truck and I could even be like, woo, that was exciting seeing a fire truck. Or I could say that, you know, or I could say a prayer for whoever needs help. But if I think it's my house and my house is on fire and I have images of my curtains on fire because I left the stove on or, you know, I start thinking things, that's going to create anxiety. So helping people understand exactly how anxiety is produced in the brain is something we can do for anxiety disorders, for post-traumatic stress disorder, for generalized anxiety disorder and, and um, OCD in a way that we can't do for a lot of other disorders. I don't know how to explain bipolar disorder in the brain. I don't even know how to explain depression in the brain. I have good ways to treat it, but if someone says, what part of my brain, you know, um, creates depression, I'd be like, uh, um, I just, mm, yeah. You know, I once went to a presentation that said depression might start in our bone marrow. I was like, oh, Lord, we really don't know. I mean, we just don't know. But I can tell them about the brain and I can explain anxiety in the brain and I can tell them how to change it, how to change the cortex. And you know how you change the cortex? The way we change the cortex um, before I wrap this up is the, the rule in the cortex is that Thoughts exist and survive and get strengthened by the ones we use. The easy way to remember it is it's the survival of the busiest. The thoughts that we use the most, the information we go over in our head the most gets stronger and stronger. The things we don't think about, you know, like our multiplication tables, if you started relying on a calculator and you haven't thought about multiplication tables for years, those get weaker and weaker and we can't use them anymore. Same thing with Spanish you might have learned. If you don't use Spanish, you lose it. The cortex is survival of the busiest, right? And that's bad news for people with OCD or people who chronically worry because they're making those thoughts stronger and stronger. They're making thoughts very strong. So we want them to not think those thoughts. There's a, there's a little phrase I like to use, and that phrase is, you can't erase, you must replace. 
So if I'm walking down the street and I'm having this image in my, in my mind of my, my house is on fire, but I have no logical reason why I should think that, right? Then what I need to do is to not, not think about my, um, my, thought, my um, house being on fire. I need to be thinking and not saying to myself, your house isn't on fire, your house is on fire, because that doesn't stop me from thinking it. It's like if I ask you right now to stop thinking about pink elephants, it doesn't stop you from thinking about pink elephants. You start thinking about pink elephants. So what we have to do in the cortex is we have to replace those thoughts. So if I am walking and I start to look at what, I hear a bird singing. What kind of bird is, oh, I think that's an Oriole. Let me see if I can see it in the trees. Um, let me make sure I pick up my dog poop here. Let me think as I get into that kind of where I am, just mindfulness about where I am, or actually start planning my dinner. What do I need to, what am I gonna make for dinner? Eating on, I kind of say a different channel. That helps re reduce the anxiety that the amygdala creates because if I'm thinking about what to make for dinner, the amygdala isn't anxious, but if I'm thinking about my house on fire, the amygdala is going to is activate and produce that fight or flight response. It's going to be activated. So this is some information that you can use. There's so much more if you read through it. I think that you will appreciate um, that. I want you to see, and so I'm you know I'm interested if there are some questions. I'm happy to answer questions if we can. And also, by the way. If you have questions we don't get to, there's my email right on the screen there, and you can definitely uh, check into that. And I gave you some other resources too. But let's see if this has any questions for me. There is a Kath, uh, question, Catherine. Uh, Jen Hames asks, how do you respond to clients' emotional reasoning? For example, I feel like this is dangerous, so it must be true. This is something the amygdala really helps you with. Because if you say, what are you feeling? And you really help them understand what they're feeling. And they say, well, my heart is pounding. I feel this, feel kind of nauseous. And I feel this feeling of dread. And you've explained, you've gone through that, the sympathetic nervous system activation. And you say, this is what it is. This is what you're feeling. So you don't want to make a mistake by saying, this activation in my body means that something bad is going to happen. And if you just sit and talk with your client and say, let's talk about some specific things in your life. You know, like, for example, I say, hey, did you ever have to give a presentation in a college class? And how did you feel before that? And they say, oh, yeah, I was nervous. And what did you feel? Kind of nauseous, you know, heart pounding. And I say, and did, how did the presentation go? And they probably they just look fine. I was fine. You know, I got a decent grade. Um, just try to remind them of all the times that their anxiety has been incorrect, where they thought someone was going to break up with them, but they, they weren't, you know, and you can't assume that that feeling is correct because the amygdala and also just introducing them to the amygdala and saying it goes on incorrect information. So for example, let's say you've had a relationship in the past that has taught your amygdala about certain triggers you may react to a trigger when you're dating a completely different person who wouldn't act in the way that that person is, but because that person did or said something that triggered a memory of another person who was abusive or who left you, you're having emotional reactions, but let's understand it's not necessarily accurate. So we try to work through how the amygdala works. And when you learn how the amygdala works, you know, if you're in a car accident and you're in the passenger seat, you're going to be, oh, sorry, you're going to be um, having a reaction to being a passenger seat. But if you're in a car accident and you're in the driver's seat, now it's terrifying to be in the driver's seat. And it's really the amygdala is learning based on a situation, but it might not even apply. The, the person that you're riding with now might be a completely safe person, whereas before you were riding with a drunk person. And no wonder you got in an accident, see, or whatever. Um, so it really, it's really about using what we know about the amygdala to um, help the person understand what's really happening in their body and knowing that when you are anxious, that does not mean a bad thing is going to happen. It means you're anxious. It means the fight or flight response is being created. And it may be useful and it may not. Okay. The, there is one, another question. People, uh, attendees, feel free to post questions now in the Q&A or chat, and I'll read them to Catherine. 
the next question is whether there's a list of evidence-based therapy providers in the larger South Bend area. Do you know if there's anything like that, Catherine? Well, what I would do is um, look for people who say they use CBT and in particular ask about exposure because exposure is so important to treating the amygdala. Now, most people know CBT in the sense of cognitive interventions, you know, like Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis and that kind of thing, but you also need to be familiar with exposure. So you can look for people who are familiar with CBT and check if they're comfortable with providing exposure because that's the way the amygdala learns. Another thing is there's a website for the ADAA, which is the um, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, the ADAA, and they have a find a therapist um, link on there where you can plug in your, your um, zip code and look for a therapist um, who is skilled in, in doing this kind of treatment. And most of us who go to the ADA a conferences, although one was canceled just recently for some strange reason, but those people who go there are often people who are skilled in the CBT approaches and have a neurological um, background too um, with understanding exposure, understanding the amygdala is involved. Uh, so you can look on, on that website, look up therapists through that for people who have the background. But you know, asking therapists for exposure, say I need exposure, or if you're, it's OCD, exposure with response prevention, because I need to address my amygdala too, not just my cortex. You can't just change the cortex and, and expect anxiety to be solved, you know? Um, sometimes I say to people, it's like there's a, um, if you only focus on the cortex, it's like when your car won't start and you're looking in the refrigerator for the problem, you know, it's, you're not even looking in the right place for what solved, what caused the problem. You got to look in the amygdala. You got to understand how to change the amygdala, rewire the whole brain, you know? So that's what I would say. So CBT, especially mentioning exposure, not just the cognitive aspects, and then the ADA website. The uh, the other thing I to add on to that, Catherine, is that the Association for Cognitive Behavioral Therapists does keep a list of people who um, at least advertise uh, that they've been trained in CBT. That's a nationwide list, um, right? And it isn't necessarily reflective of people who've been trained locally in CBT. Uh, but that's another resource you can look at, uh, mm -hmm. and then. Psychology Today, if you're looking for therapists locally, you certainly get a lot of information if you go on Psychology Today, pretty sure that's mm -hmm. and uh, look for, you know, keywords. So CBT or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy or Exposure Response Therapy, those are all keywords that you could put in for whatever area you're right. looking at. Right. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> are you taking referrals, Catherine? <laughs> My, my caseload is full right now. I do have a partner and we, and Lisa, are you taking referrals? Uh, I, a small number of referrals. We're heading into the summertime, which is a little bit trickier for adding mm -hmm. clients in. Um, there are good, ther great therapists locally. And uh, you know, there is no master list of therapists in the area and that certainly you know, one of the initiatives that MHAM is working on is to try and do a little bit more organizing of therapy resources. And so we will, anybody who's attended today will be on our email list to see some of the initiatives that we're gonna be um, uh, uh, putting forward. So it's, you know, having good therapy uh, is something that, you know, we want uh, for everyone in the community and making um, trainings available like this one, we hope will um, move us all forward, you know, in learning new skills and being effective in our work. Um, I will, you know, say that Catherine's book, Rewire the Anxious Brain, uh, I think is really an excellent resource. And, you know, Catherine, I'm going to promote your book, even if <laughs> somewhat conflicted about doing that. Um, I would suggest picking it up if you're a client or if you're a therapist, I think you would learn um, what Catherine has presented here uh, in a very user-friendly way. So, And that's the goal. And, you know, you can work through that with a client if you're, or you can work through it and then, then work, work on it and seek some help. 
one of the things I would say about exposure therapy is a lot of people don't, a lot of therapists are kind of reluctant to do that because we're, you know, when we get into therapy, we really want to, we really want to help people feel less anxiety. And part of exposure therapy is putting people through some anxiety, obviously. And um, it's, but it's a very effective approach and it teaches the amygdala. If you don't know how to do that and you're willing to learn, we need you too. We need people who want to be trained in doing exposure therapy and uh, not be reluctant because teaching the amygdala requires the person to actually see or hear what it is that they're having an anxiety response to. Okay. Catherine, I am going to wrap things up. Um, I'm so, you know, MHAM is really appreciative of your giving your time and talent today. And, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, for I appreciate the opportunity. This is something that should be available to everybody. You know, yeah. we know how to treat anxiety. We should be doing it by knowing what's going on in the brain. All right. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to close this out and please everyone who's participating look for the link that I'm going to send out shortly to complete our evaluation. Um, we love to hear ideas of other presentations that you want us to pull together. Um, so please uh, complete the evaluation, share your ideas, and thank you so much for participating today. Yes, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll check my email and respond to those. All right. Thank you, Catherine.